Good afternoon, YouTube, and welcome back to the Suburban Proletarian on this particularly dreary Sunday in late January. My name is Greg, and I do apologize if you can hear the sound of rain hitting the tin roof just above my head. I'm working with a brand new camera, a brand new shotgun microphone, all thanks to OG, my old man. Thanks, Dad. And today I'd like to talk to you about what is easily the weirdest watch I have in my collection today. Furthermore, it's the weirdest watch I've ever owned, and I've owned more than a few watches. But I'd be willing to take it a step further and say that it's probably one of the weirdest watches ever manufactured anywhere by anyone. And of course, I am aware of just how bold a claim that is, of the multitude of watches that have been manufactured over the years. Some have incorporated the most outlandish and fantastic complications, sometimes bordering on the obscene. So a watch would have to be pretty darn special to qualify as one of the weirdest ones ever made. But I would argue that the watch I'm holding right here in my hand lives up to the task. This can do one thing that I don't think any other watch ever made has been able to do. And I'll explain in a moment. But I'm sure you're all wondering just exactly what it is. And there you have it. Now, I know what you're thinking. What is this guy smoking? That's a Timex Iron Man. There's nothing strange about that. It's not weird at all. Except it is. It's very, very weird. And I will explain why in just a few moments. Well, not why exactly. I have no idea why it's weird, but I will explain in what way it's weird. But before we move over to the tabletop, let's do the obligatory wristwatch check. Today I am wearing my little Chinese standard from Shanghai Watch Company. This is a diminutive little 35 and a half millimeter watch, although I don't think it looks too terribly small on my wrist. Um, standard Tangji movement, 19 joules manual wind. This has been a wonderful little watch. It's a little bit slow. I do prefer my watches to run a little bit fast if they're going to be off but it's only about 20 seconds slow a day. This watch will be appearing in an upcoming installment of my Proletarian Watches of the World series. Uh, it's going to be stacked up against a Soviet Vostok and an East German Rula, and that's going to be coming up in the next few weeks, so I hope you check that one out as well. So without any further ado, let's get talking about the Iron Man. All right, guys, so here it is, and I will be the first to admit at first blush, it doesn't look particularly unusual, but please bear with me because in just a few minutes, it's going to get very, very, very weird indeed. Now, as most of you already undoubtedly know, uh, the Timex Iron Man has been from the very beginning the main competitor for the Casio G-Shock. Here's a 5600 G-Shock, just about as representative an example as we can find. Uh, both of these watches compete for the same market share. They are used for much of the same activities. Both are very rugged. Both are very reliable. I don't really need to cover that here because it's been covered in depth elsewhere. Um, I would say that the main difference, other than water resistance and maybe shock resistance, between these two watches lies in the operation of their respective electronic modules. The Casio is much more straightforward and intuitive in its use, and the Iron Man provides a level of functionality that the Casio simply cannot compare with. Um, so let's discard the Casio because we're not here to talk about that. As I've said, the Iron Man is quite complex. At times, it almost seems like a self-indulgent exercise in electronic engineering. It's as if the engineers who work for Timex were just trying to see what they could do with a watch. The layout is fairly standard. We've got a mode button down here, as is often the case, and it toggles through various modes of operation. We've got a chrono mode, which has, for some reason, a 100 lap memory. This watch was pretty much the pinnacle of electronic sophistication for standard Timex watches. I don't know, Timex might be developing smart watch technology now, but as far as straightforward digital watches, this one takes the cake. It's got a 100 lap memory, uh, there's laps and split times, and I don't even know what SEG is. Uh, the buttons are all backwards. There's six of them. Some do this button and this button seem to do the same thing at times. This button and this button do the same seem to do the same thing at times. 
Some functions within the chronograph require only a quick press of a button. Some require you to hold a button for a long time. Uh, you have to store your lap times before you can zero them out. It's just way too complicated. Um, there's a timer mode again. There are reps, intervals. I think there's like five different timers. I don't know. There is the alarm mode. There are five different alarms in two different time zones. Also quite difficult to set and counterintuitive in operation. There's a memo mode. Now this is a really 1990s thing. For those of you who can't remember a time before smartphones, uh, this was a function for dinosaurs like me. You could store a few telephone numbers or passwords or security codes into this uh, memo function. There's several pages of memos. And that would allow you to carry around this uh, valuable information in the relative security of your wrist. So we hit the mode button one more time and that takes us back to the home screen. So I've managed to illustrate that this watch is a little bit overcomplicated in operation, but nothing I've presented so far qualifies as particularly weird. But for those of you who have hung with me this long, this is where it starts to get weird. The home screen. So you can see, right down here in the bottom corner of the display screen, it shows T1. This is, a, uh, at least ostensibly, a dual time zone watch. And the T1 display indicates that we're looking at time zone 1. I live on the east coast of the United States. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. I have the second time zone set to Zulu time or UTG or Greenwich Mean Time, however you want to refer to it. And in England, it is now 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Now you can see on the watch, we have the year displayed here, which is a little bit unusual. We have the month, we have the date, obviously the hours, the minutes, the seconds, the day of the week, all pretty standard stuff. But things start to get a little bit strange when we go to set the time. If I press in the set button here and hold it, we will enter the set mode. And you can see up here, it says time zone 1 is displayed. And I can toggle back and forth between time zone 1 and time zone 2. But if I hit select here, we are now into time zone 1. And the very first option is to zero the seconds. I'm not going to do that because I have the watch synchronized already with the atomic clock. But we can now toggle through. Um, there's the hours, the minutes the month, the date, the year. Now usually when you set the year in a digital watch, that's just to keep the perpetual calendar on track, but in the case of the Iron Man, the year is actually displayed on the home screen. So we toggle again, and we have the option to select 24 or 12 hour time, and now we're back to T1. If I toggle over to T2 and enter, and so, as you can see, when I enter the set page for time zone 2, the first option I get is not zeroing the seconds. As a matter of fact, if I toggle through, it never gives me the option. And of course, that stands to reason. The watch is going to want to keep both of the time zones synchronized. So now we could just go ahead and change our hour, which I'm not going to do because I don't really want to change the time, and hit set again, and we're still set for Eastern Standard Time and Zulu Time. And of course, that's what most people would do. But with my overactive imagination, I started wondering what would happen if I started changing the other values in time zone 2. I mean, it would stand to reason that they would change the corresponding values in time zone 1 to keep everything synchronized. But I decided to try it. And here's what I found out. I held down Enter Mode. Let's select time zone 2. And hit Enter. Okay, I, it's fine. It can stay Zulu time. That's no problem. Um, but let's offset the minutes now. Um, let's just make it 1600 exactly. And let's make it... Mm, let's see. We'll make it May... Tenth, 
And we'll change the year to 2001. Now if we press set, all the values should be changed in time zone 1 as well, right? I mean, that's the only thing that would possibly make sense. Except they weren't. In time zone 1, it's still 2018, it's still January 29th, and it's still 11.15 in the morning. But in time zone 2, it is now the year 2001, May 10th, 402, 402 in the afternoon, and it's a Thursday. Now that right there, that is some straight-up Doctor Who bullshit. What possible purpose could that have in the world? 2001 and 2018. This is not a dual time zone watch. This is a dual timeline watch. This watch is trans-dimensional. So now my wrists are getting pretty stiff, and I'm sure you're sick and tired of looking at the watch. So let's head back over to the bookshelves to discuss the implications of this. So what are the implications of all of this? The truth is, I simply don't know. Even with weeks to think about making this video and prepare for it, it's a concept that I'm having a very difficult time wrapping my head around. Time, as a fourth dimension, is a very difficult concept for the human brain to visualize, even when we look at it in a very linear fashion. We can remember what happened to us yesterday, and we can imagine what might happen to us tomorrow, but pretty much we're stuck right here in the now. When you start throwing other timelines and other dimensions into the mix, all bets are out the window. And I can't think of any real-world application for the utility that this watch provides. Even if you subscribe to Multiverse Theory and you accept the idea that everything that's ever happened or ever will happen anywhere in the universe is, in fact, happening right here and right now, it's impossible to imagine any reason to keep track of the time in a different timeline. In order for someone to extract the utility inherent in this watch, you would need access to a TARDIS, or something very much like a TARDIS, or the opening of a wormhole. Dual time zone watches are mostly useful to travelers. The first GMT watches were made for pilots and other international travelers. The only person that could make use of this watch's capabilities would be a time traveler. Of course, as far as Timex is concerned, this is a dual time zone watch. And its real-world application is to offset the hours by a certain number to indicate the time in another time zone. But I've tried to imagine some other real-world applications for this watch, and I've only been able to come up with a few, and they're really, really far-fetched. First of all, the perpetual calendar inside this watch covers the span of years from 1990 to 2089. Now, when the watch was first introduced in the late 1990s, there were somewhere between 9 and 13 other solar systems that were within 10 light years of ours. And so an astronomer who was monitoring one of the stars in one of those solar systems could keep the equivalent time on Earth for what he's seeing in real time in the second time zone of this watch. But what practical purpose would that have? If you know that Alpha Centauri is seven light years away from Earth and it goes into supernova, you'll know when it went into supernova by simply subtracting seven years. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Then it occurred to me that maybe an author who was writing a novel in the form of a journal and was doing so by making actual daily entries into his journal novel could keep track of a second timeline using the second time zone. But that doesn't make a lot of sense either. I mean, if you're writing a book like that, and you are in fact writing an entry every day, all you've got to do is look at yesterday's entry and add a day. So that doesn't make much sense. Or if someone was a very avid gardener, and they know exactly what date they like to plant their peas, and what days they like to plant their onions, and their potatoes, and their cabbage, and they're moving from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere, or the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere, to a very similar latitude, they could simply reverse the solstices in the two time zones in this watch, and you could always press that button and find out what the equivalent date would be in the hemisphere with which you are accustomed. But that's pretty far-fetched as well. Even if you move to the exact same latitude in, in the other hemisphere, 
the chances are the climate is not going to be exactly the same, so clearly that's out the window as well. That's about all I can think of. If you guys have any more ideas, please feel free to post them in the comments below. I would love to hear them. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and click the like button. If you hated it, go ahead and click the dislike button. And if you've enjoyed this self-indulgent exercise in navel-gazing and you'd like to see more of the same, please consider subscribing to my channel. It only takes a single click of the mouse or a stab at your screen. It doesn't cost a penny and would go a long way to keeping me here on YouTube. Uh, YouTube has recently changed the rules. It's no longer about viewers. It's all about subscribers. You can always unsubscribe in the future. If in the future my channel's not living up to your expectations, you not only have my blessing, but the moral imperative to unsubscribe. Content without creative integrity has no place here on the tube. If I start to suck, starve me off the air. But if I don't, I hope to see all of you here again next time. Later, guys.